everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food. I'm here with my co-host, Gary D. Matei. Say hi, hi, Gary. Karen. How are you today? Good. Very good. You look well. Thank you. And today we're very excited because we get to eat chocolate. Yeah, we're really excited about this. And maybe some of you remember it was a little more than a year ago that we invited Andrea Young into the Progressive Radio Network studio and we got to eat chocolate then and andrea young is the founder of sweet vegan yes i met andrea at balducci's which i don't think is there any longer sadly on the upper west side yes or it's actually in midtown isn't it soho no it was actually the the balducci's oh. right before columbus circle it's the okay one that makes sense near uh, whole foods yeah. Okay. So uh, I walked in there one day and I saw this very dynamic human beings displaying her chocolate and it said vegan. And then so I walked up and said, what? This is <laughs> vegan. I'm a vegan. Let me get to know you. So anyway, our relationship started at Balducci's and then I introduced Andrea to you and you had Andrea on the show and I was fortunate enough to be a part of the show at that point too. And so here we are again right before Mother's Day to talk about what else? Sweet Chocolate. vegan treats. Right, sweet vegan. Okay, so here we are and we're talking with Andrea Young who happens to be in her kitchen. Yes, she's in her kitchen. Stirring up a little pot of something that looks chocolatey. Hi, Hi Andrea. Andrea. Hey, how are you both? So nice to be here again. You know, I wish we could all be together, but that's, we'll get there. Yeah, it's great to see you. And thank you so much for the chocolates. What are you making? Well, I'm making a little ganache. I'm making some little samples of chocolates. So this is a totally soy-free, nut-free, gluten-free, dairy-free chocolate. And I've just heated it up to a temper zone. And we're going to be adding some flavors to it and just having some fun with it. And it's just all about creating and being fun in the kitchen, which I love to do. Wow. Well, you look... Fantastic. And I'm envious about, I envy your stove. Your stove is something to be envied. It really <laughs> looks fantastic. Now, are you in a New York apartment or are you in a house? No, actually, this is a New York apartment. I live on the Upper West Side. So sometimes just for fun, I make all my uh, chocolates in a commercial kitchen, of course. But when I like to just have fun in my own kitchen, I like to sort of heat up some chocolate and just have a little playtime. And then also I love to rehearse and practice for some of the classes that I teach. Because I don't know if you know, but I'm teaching classes, Airbnb now, and some of the vegan groups around the country. So it's nice to be able to share the love of chocolate and get people to come to the classes. And many of the classes are totally free. Wow. So we have wow. one coming up with Veg Michigan next week even. Wow, how do people find out about these classes? Well, you're welcome to come to my website. I have them posted as well as on my Instagram. And the one that's coming up on Thursday is going to be Strawberry Sensation. And that's going to be on the 29th. And the one that's coming up on the 27th, that's going to be my Blueberry Bliss Chocolate Making. Ooh. So totally free or donations quested. And it's just a great way to give back to the community and let people have the fun of making vegan chocolates. Now, what people don't know or what some people may not know about you, Andrea, is not only are you this amazing chocolate maker, but you have this great resume, this history in architecture and working for some amazing companies and, and doing some great designs. And then life happened and, what, and it led you to your kitchen making chocolate. And we all get to benefit from that. Yes. It's an extraordinary I, resume that you have. I think it's all about reinvention, especially with what's been happening with the COVID. You know, so many people have been really down and out. And I'm part of that crowd. All of my business really at that point was really event-based and meeting with my customers and being out there sharing through WeWorks and William Sonomas and Joe Malone's. And those were all great ways to meet customers and to build you know, opportunity for people to try free samples and purchase. But then with COVID, everything really took a back seat. So I really had to, as they say, pivot and reinvent myself and figure out how can I reach my customer? And thanks to you guys and many other people, a lot of suggestions came in 
And I decided to really reach out to our first responders. And that's what I did. I reached out to hospitals and EMS through the fire departments and many friends that were working in vegan communities that were now volunteer. And I said, nominate someone that we can share about on a blog and celebrate their accomplishments and how they're giving back to the community. So that's what I did. I made a couple thousand pieces of chocolate wow. and I delivered them support and also by hand to all five boroughs and giving to the police departments as well as the fire departments. So it was a, an amazing experience and I met so many people all virtually, just like you're doing now with the community and outreach that you have. Wow, that's just a tremendous story. Thank you so much for what you're doing, especially for the first responders. That's really wonderful. Thank you. It gives you hope when you hear about the nurses that came from California and the people that flew in just to be a part of the, the healing process for New York City. It gave me great hope and inspiration. And I hopefully I could share that on my blog. And if anybody wants to read about it, it's certainly all there on my website, sweetvegan.nyc. And actually, Yahoo Finance did an article all about a little small entrepreneurial company that made a difference in the world with chocolate. So I'm happy to share that link with you guys and you can share it with your listeners as well. Absolutely. I think we all need to read stories like this to help us feel better in these particularly crazy times. Yes, I agree. And I also agree that we all need chocolate during these particularly what? crazy times. So can we try some? We're going to try some chocolate right now. Is so, so what Andrea has done is given us a box, very generously, a box of sweet vegan truffles. Dreamy bites. Isn't this packaging fabulous? Andrea has a, well, you let them know, Andrea. You went to Parsons, right? And received a... Yes received a degree in design, did you not? Correct, it was called environmental design. So that really gave me an overview of different design practices. And I chose to go into architecture. So that's really been my passion for years. Right. And also a part of it is anything to do with graphics or anything to do with packaging or anything to do with an experience that makes you feel good. Walking into a room, looking at your silverware, your utensils, a piece of chocolate, or a beautiful box, just yeah. something to make you feel a, a good aha moment, right? Yeah. Right, like this is special. This packaging is unbelievably beautiful. Okay, I really love it. Okay, let's open it up. I well, I also wanted to repeat, because I think this is very important. A couple of my students, I teach theater arts and acting and writing online. And a couple of my students are allergic to nuts and cannot eat chocolate because of that. And I just want everyone out there to know that Andrea's chocolate is nut free, as well as being vegan, of course. That's a really important thing now, because just like having to wash your hands if you are interacting with people these days, you also should wash your hands if you're eating things like nuts, because people can- Some people are really- Really, allergic. really yeah. sensitive. So this is really great to know that your chocolate is nut free and vegan as well. So we have four flavors, right? Let's start with one. Now, yes. they look the same, so we don't know what's what. Yeah, we do, because there's a little guy oh, here. Okay. So right now, we're going to try the Energizing Espresso. Ener I need that. So while I'm cutting it in half, making my half bigger than Karen's, tell us about Energizing Espresso. What do you do with this? Espresso beans that I use and get flown in, and they're all organic. And I use a rice milk and a little tiny bit of sea salt, coconut oil, and also just a little bit of a coffee liqueur that I make myself. Mm -hmm. So it's oh. all those fine, and then it's dipped in a 70% dark chocolate. And what you're enjoying is actually my spring break box of chocolates, which is my seasonal subscription box. So each season I offer a new flavor based on the season that we're celebrating. Mmm, delicious. Mm. Wow. I also have a little hot beverage here that I'm going to wash it down with. <laughs> Delicious. Coffee and chocolate are a great combination. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now the next we're going to try. Now these are, this is a great gift for Mother's Day, which is coming up. Well, it's a great gift for any anybody. Day. You can get this for me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, the next one we're going to try is Raspberry Royale. Did I say that correctly? 
You sure did. Excellent. Okay. Tell so us about Raspberry Royale while we dig in. Well, Raspberry Royale is probably my favorite flavor in the box. Mm. Not that I'm biased, but and it has the essence of a fresh raspberry. So when you bite into that, you should just have a burst of flavor that comes alive on your palate. And just the smoothness and the creaminess of the chocolate should just be melting on your tongue right now. And you should just be saying, oh, wow, I feel really good. Huh. And because we don't use any white sugar, it has a really nice way of staying with you without feeling like you have to the entire box. Mm. Okay, let me ask you a question. Can I get a box of just Raspberry Royale? Yes, you can, because we're in the spring time right now. I can make you something special just for you. Oh, well, my mom loves raspberries and she's probably listening to this, but this is what I would get her. Yeah, we're gonna definitely have oh. to uh, order some of this. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> now, we'll put on the website how people out there listening can order as well. The next one we're trying is strawberry sensation. Right, so how is that different from raspberry other than it's strawberry and raspberry? Is there anything different other than the fruit? Well, let's find out. Yeah, I think the taste tells you everything. I would say this is my most popular flavor. People really gravitate towards strawberries. So that's why I have a whole class of mm. strawberries and chocolates together. Mm. It's such an amazing opportunity to experience strawberries when they're in their freshest moment, which is the springtime. Oh, that's good. Oh, wow, that's great. I feel like it's spring now all of a sudden. <laughs> I know, all of a sudden, all the fragrances. I wasn't feeling in the spring mood, but now I totally am. What do you think, Kara? Well, it's very different from the raspberry. And I was thinking, because they're berries, they would be similar, but they're very different. Very different, very different, mm -hmm. very good too. Very mm. good. All right. Are we ready for the last? The last one. Okay. The last one is called Tangent Spice. Tell us about this one, Andrea. Well, this is a little bit of an experience with a chocolate and a margarita. So oh. it's just a welcome to spring with a little bit of sea salt, chili, pepper flavor, and fresh lime. Oh. So it's a combination of three flavors that you wouldn't necessarily think would go together with your chocolate, but it's an element of surprise when you bite into it. Mmm, I like it, really good. Mm. Great. You're good with that, combining unique flavors that you don't normally think should go together, but do with chocolate. I think that's what the joy that chocolate offers when you make a ganache. So that's why every single season that I offer, it's an experience, it's an element of joy, and it's enjoying the moment of the season with chocolate. I like it, good stuff. I have it in my mouth, but I wanna say, <laughs> let's expand a little bit more on this idea, your idea of chocolate as an experience. This isn't just something you cram in your mouth. This is an experience that you should savor. Right. So if we talk for a moment about the mainstream chocolate, a Hershey bar and some of the others, Number one, we don't know where they source their chocolate because they won't tell us. And it's probably from the Ivory Coast with child slaves, but they don't want to divulge that. And on top of that, it's just such low quality, a lot of sugar, a lot of other ingredients, and it's cheap. And it's cheap for lots of reasons. And when you eat a chocolate bar like that, that's so accessible and cheap. I mean, you may like it, but it's not an experience no. of the senses. Right. <laughs> And this truly is an experience of the senses. And what is life about? Just shoving in whatever you can in your mouth or really making the most of everything. And that's that's why we get excited about sweet vegan chocolate. Yes, I'm very excited about it. So there you go. Okay, how long do you have to cook that chocolate that's on the stove? Well, I have to heat it for about 20 minutes and we bring it up to the temper zone, which is about 114 degrees. And I'll check it with the thermometer and then I'll quickly flash and bring it down to about 88 degrees. And then it's in temper. And at that point, I can actually start dipping one of my favorite things, which is organic strawberries. Oh, no. I love organic strawberries and chocolate. And they're such a great gift to give to someone that you care about. It just shows the passion of chocolate and the love of a strawberry. So that combination is what I'm offering for 
you to give to friends, loved ones, and anybody that happens to be in the New York area. We're offering pickup and or delivery. Wow. So that's that once you can just call us up and place an order and we'll have it ready for you or we'll make sure that it gets delivered to your loved one. Oh, that's really wonderful. Now we have one of these strawberries here. We actually have two of them, one for Karen and one for me, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And I'm going to sample it right now. And me it's, too. Oh, it cuts beautifully. Oh. And Karen, here's your half. Yummy. And here's my half. Mm -hmm. So you've done this with tempering the chocolate. You've given the hard shell. Yes. The key to it is you want to bring it to the right temperature and then cool it down so that when you dip your chocolates, they don't get the streak or the bloom that can happen when chocolate's not in temper. So it's all about just making them look beautiful. Mm, delicious. Fantastic. Delicious. Thank you so much. What else can we tell our listeners about what you're up to? Well, I think that the important thing is to get involved with your community, share the love of chocolate, come on board and take one of my Airbnb classes. What's really fun is invite your friends and take a private class. Mm. Bring me up and I could do a little private class for you and your family or you and your friends, whatever number we put together. You get a recipe that you can make on your own independently. Don't feel that you have to actually make the recipe in the class. You're certainly welcome just to follow along. It's a fun-filled class where we do lots and lots of trivia. So we learn all about sources for chocolate and learning all about vegan. And we also learn the great qualities of making a ganache that doesn't require any cream, any butter, or any animal products. So you too can surprise your family and loved ones with an amazing plant-based ganache that will just knock people's socks off. So I love cooking. I love sharing the love of cooking together with friends and family. So I invite you all to check out my different classes on the 27th of April and the 29th of April coming up very soon. Sounds great, Andrea, thank you. This has been a wonderful gift. You've made my day. Made my day too, Andrea, thank you so much. And now I know what I'm well, gonna do. Well, thank you so Mother's much for inviting me. You're thank very thank welcome. Thank you, happy Mother's Day to you guys. Thank you, Andrea, we will talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. That was Andrea Young, everybody, of Sweet Vegan. Vegan. We like Andrea. We like Andrea. We like chocolate. And we don't eat a lot of chocolate. But when we do, it should be... Andrea's chocolate. Andrea's a chocolate experience. <laughs> yes. And I really like seeing Andrea's wonderful stove. We have to ask her what, what kind, kind of, of stove? stove she has in her apartment <laughs> in New York. Those of you that were listening couldn't see that. Andrea was actually talking with us as she was stirring a pot of chocolate. She was tempering some chocolate. And you know, I'm going to grab a screenshot and post that on our webpage. Yeah, that was really wonderful. Andrea, it was great having you on the program. Yay, Hooray! Andrea. All and right. so we ate some chocolate. It was yummy. Totally yummy. And so is that getting you more in the celebratory mood? Well, or, um, I've been kind of celebrating because it's five because, days after my birthday. Yeah, because we we didn't really do all of the things we normally do. We didn't go out to a fancy restaurant. I didn't make a cake. You didn't make a cake. And, and sometimes I've even made a cake for you, which aren't like your cakes, but neither one of us made a cake. We weren't in the mood. Well, what did we have? We, we had... weren't in the mood, but we had a little not a moo late at night with a little candle in it. Yeah, so you did blow out a candle, yes, which was I did. important. Uh, which in my family is essential. Oh, so essential. I, I never knew that about your family traditions. There was one time, I'm remembering now, I was traveling. This was a long time ago, folks. Long before COVID. Long before 9-11. <laughs> This was a long time ago, and I was sitting in Los Angeles airport, and it was my birthday, and I brought with me a little, some vegan chocolate cake I picked up at a health food store and candles, and I was going to sing myself a little happy birthday song and blow out the candle, and I didn't have any matches. It was funny. I had to look around. You know, there was no smoking in the airport. In the airports, right. But I managed to find some matches and, and sang myself the song. That's because your mom is very, very much into that. She wants Definitely. you to make sure. You have to think of your wishes and, and blow out the candle. Blow out a candle. That's really important to your to I like mom. it. Yeah. 
I like it too. I think it's great. And you were able to do that. I saw my brother and sister at my mom's a few weeks before my birthday. And they, of course, grew up with the same tradition. My sister brought with her some Emmys cookies and brought them out after we had our lunch and put a little candle Aww. in it. So I had And my so Emmy's cookies in. are vegan? Obviously. Emmy's cookies are vegan and they they're either all raw or almost raw. So right. it's a blend of coconut and f- vanilla. This was a vanilla cookie, but they're really yummy, simple. Excellent. Mostly whole food kind of cookies. Yeah, I think it's wonderful that a lot of these companies are now starting to go vegan with their products or are launching a completely vegan product. I mean, yeah, a lot of these are small startups that are still right. starting up. Right. That's why they're called startups. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, we need that. I know you're involved in a lot right now. And that's one of the reasons why we didn't really have a major celebration for your birthday, because you are doing quite a bit of work with the Food Revolution Summit. Yeah, so we're right in the middle of the 10th Annual Food Revolution Summit 2021. And if you haven't been tuning in, it's not too late. This goes all week until Sunday. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the Food Revolution Summit. What is that for folks who are listening that maybe have never heard about this before? Well, it's not unlike a podcast, but what's different about it is it's concentrated They focus on particular themes, and John Robbins is the interviewer. John Robbins. John Robbins, the author of the 1987 bestseller, Groundbreaking Diet for New America. He has that wonderful story of giving up the ice cream empire of Baskin and Robbins. Right, it's a wonderful story. And going off on his own path. A lot's happened since then, but now he and his son Ocean have the Food Revolution Network, and they started this summit 10 years ago, and some of the best experts in nutrition are a part of this program. Not only nutrition, but plant-based nutrition, right? Plant-based nutrition. You would say this summit is plant-leaning, right? Definitely plant-leaning. Now, it's interesting because I'm here to make vegans, everybody. I'm here to make vegans. The Food Revolution Summit is not about being vegan. They want to encourage more people to eat more plants And they encourage what is called a plant-based diet, which can mean different things to different people. And it mostly focuses on health, correct? Focuses on health health. primarily. Right. Many of the people that they interview promote a vegan diet. But some people actually come from, should I say, the other side of the alternative health movement. There have been some paleo-leaning people, some functional medicine-leaning people that Talk about including some animal products in your diet. And sometimes that leads to a bit of confusion with the audience. Sure. And one of the things that I do during the summit is I'm corresponding with the people asking questions in the comment section below the audio picture for the program. So if somebody was to tune in, ask a question, there's a good possibility, a strong possibility that that you would would be answering. Yes. Okay. So if you tune in, say hi to Karen if you ask a question. Hi. And it's intense. And I'll admit, I'm exhausted. Right. Because the information is fascinating. It's inspiring. And if you're sitting back and listening to three hours or you choose to do uh, one at a time and maybe tune in later because they play them all day long throughout the day. Oh, that's great. So if you can't really tune in when they're live, you can tune in later. and Within the same day. Within the same day. Because the next day they refresh and start all new. But I'm there... In the morning, listening to the three hours of programming while I'm answering questions. And it's it's intense for me. Yes. I feel intense. like uh, you'd be compared to a, um, a coder that you're coding all day. I mean, your face is literally in the computer screen, staring at the computer screen, and your fingers are on the keyboard, and you are just nonstop working for like three hours Yeah, straight. but you know what helps? I've been doing this a lot. This is my morning routine. Yeah, tell us Not about your morning routine. Not every day. Tell us about your morning routine. This is but great. But many days. Right. And I've put this together from listening to a number of different people. But what I do is I wake up. I think of nice things. You wake up, get out of bed, drag a comb across your head. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
And the first thing I do is I warm some water up and I'll make a glass of hot lemon. Now I put in lemon peels, lemon peels or lime peels. So what we do is we use a lot of lemon and lime juice. We cut up the peels that we don't use and I freeze them so that they stay yeah. fresh. And then I take, grab a few of them and mix them with hot water. So I'm getting hydrated. I'm getting those nice flavonoids from the lemon or lime peel. And it also gives a nice flavor. At the same time, I'll make some sort of tea. Now, sometimes it's matcha, which is a green tea. And then sometimes I'll do a ginger, turmeric, black pepper, soy milk latte, which is very nice. Very nice. And how do I do it? I take ginger powder, turmeric powder, and black pepper. I usually take a teaspoon of ginger a half a teaspoon of turmeric and a pinch or two of black pepper. I pour the hot water over the spices, mix it up, and I like to add a little soy milk. And all of the spices here at Responsible Eating and Living are organic. Organic, right. absolutely. Right. And sometimes I'll make a, a some other white tea or green tea, something like that. And then while I'm sitting and drinking these lovely drinks, I do a form of meditation and then I do my face exercises. So some of you may be familiar with face yoga. There's a lot of face yoga routines on YouTube, different people selling programs. What I did is I looked through a lot of them online on YouTube and I put together my own program. And I've been doing it for about three months. I have to say that I haven't seen dramatic results, but I see positive improvement, which is very encouraging. But I also enjoy doing it. I like isolating different parts of my face and getting to know different parts of my face and exercising them. I just enjoy it. And it's kind of meditative. And it makes you feel refreshed. It makes me, it wakes me up. Then I do a seven minute workout. So there now, tell are us about of, your seven minute workout because um, why seven minutes? The New York Times advertised it a few years ago and that's what turned me on to it. There are different seven minute workouts, but the idea is that this is not necessarily my workout for the day, but it's a way to get your blood moving. And there are a lot of health benefits to doing intense exercise, short bouts of intense exercise. So I do that. And that consists of 30 seconds of, I think, 12 different exercises. So I do a wall sit, jumping jacks, push-ups, sit-ups, a plank, side planks on both sides, step up. It's anyway, an it's a vigorous yeah. seven-minute workout. workout, which you found in the New York Times. They ran a piece yeah, it's on it. Called Seven minute workout. There's so, also a seven minute advanced workout, which I haven't started yet. Now, sometimes it takes me nine minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't take exactly it's seven okay minutes. It's okay if it takes you nine but minutes. But I really like it because it gets your blood going. It is great exercise. And if you don't get to do your routine later in the day, you don't feel guilty because you've done something. Then tell us this is the good part coming up. And then what do you do after you and do And then your... I can't believe I'm doing this, but I take a cold shower. A cold shower? What? <laughs> so maybe some of you have heard of Wim Hof. He has programs where he promotes cold therapy. He does all kinds of crazy things in cold weather in the snow, and it dramatically improves your immune system. So the idea of taking a cold shower is really charges your immune system. I have to admit, I've never liked cold cold water. I like to swim and I'm not someone who jumps right into the pool. I always have to go slowly and kind of get my body right. used to the water. But now that you've taken cold showers every day for the last three months, it's I might be, be able to jump into a pool. It's going to be a lot easier for you. <laughs> well, you know, not to interrupt you because you are on a roll. It's really wonderful to listen to your routine. But when I was learning to swim, one of the things that we were told to do before jumping in the pool was take a cold shower. Mm to get your body ready for the yeah cold. And when you jump in a cold pool after taking an even colder shower the pool seems warm so maybe this is the trick but anyway continue i've still got work to do in the cold shower because i i kind of i put my left hand in i put my left that's hysterical. hand out, that's i put hysteri- my left hand in i that's, shake it all about that's just hysterical I do the hokey pokey you know <laughs> I turn myself around, <laughs> kind of inching you into the water. sort of almost get in the shower, not quite. Yeah, and then another thing is one of these face yoga gurus recommends a hundred cold water splashes. So while I'm in the cold water shower, I do... 100 uh, cold water splashes? Yeah, maybe 50. 100 gets a little <laughs> boring, but I splash my face too with the cold water. Okay, 
then I'm ready. Then you're ready. I'm ready. I've done my face yoga. I've done my exercise. I've had my cold shower. I've had my hot drinks. I'm ready. So you sit down at the computer and you change lives by answering questions. And then at and some what point, are, I get hungry. Because um, people are talking about food, Oh, right? my God. That's the hardest part. Right. Yeah. You're starving. Today, so you don't eat anything before you start no, this. No, because normally we don't eat until late. Right. We do that intermittent fasting thing, not intentionally. It just kind of works well, out when that people way. are talking about food, 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 and you're answering food questions, you're salivating. Yeah. Wow. So I'm fortunate because I have a live-in chef. You do? I do. Aren't you lucky? And he just like comes over and says, you know, can I get you something for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That guy's a keeper. He is. Yeah. yeah. His name's Gary. Hey, my name's Gary. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, what are some of the most common questions? Because I'm sure when you have people talking of the vegan persuasion, leaning more vegan on the Food Revolution Summit, what are some of the common questions? Is it like all, where do you get your protein? Or is there something a little more complex? I found this year that the questions were not as typical, which in some ways was positive, that maybe the mass of people together were getting a little more educated. But there were protein questions, absolutely. People that were listening to the interviews and really having the light bulb go off and saying, wow, I got to do this. I got to eat plants. And then some would say, well, you know, what are good sources of plant protein? And then you have to go and say all plants have protein. Well, you know, the Food Revolution Network has been around for a long time now, and they have built their library. They have a blog post for just about every question that comes up. So it's very easy to link their blog post to a lot of these questions. That makes my work a lot easier because I used to have to write up the answer every time myself. I want to talk about a few more questions that people ask. Great. And I always smile because I understand the confusion. So we have some experts that are promoting no sugar, no salt, no oil. SOS, right? SOS. Dr. Furman, one of my favorites, of course, he's one of them. And there are others. And then you get some other people on that are implying that oil is okay. Mm. And then people are confused. Confusing. Yeah. It's an interesting space to be in. Personally, this is how I feel about it. I know that all oils are not health foods. They are not health foods like kale, mushrooms, berries. They are not. But if we have them sparingly, they're okay. Once in a while. Once in a while, occasionally, because... Some of those oils are really delicious. Don't go pouring them on everything. When you watch some of these food shows and you watch these chefs say, I'm just going to put a little teaspoon of oil here on the bottom of the pan. It is literally (laughs) four or five ounces of oil that they're calling a teaspoon. Right. It's a joke. So measure your oil. Only use a teaspoon. Only use a teaspoon. And a teaspoon goes a long way on a hot pan. That much I know. I also think that we shouldn't use oils in cooking. Okay. That we could use oil sparingly as a flavoring drizzled on something. As a topping. As a topping. Yeah, because oils will break down with heat. There are some oils that do better with high heat than others. It's so easy to saute without oil. So that's one of the things that I was telling people because they were wondering How do you not use oil? Sure. Saute with stock, with vegetable stock. Saute with, if you drink beer, sauteing with beer is good. If you drink wine, sauteing with wine or just water. Or just water or tea sometimes. Yes, we've done teas before. What are some of the Uh, other Another one is there's a confusion around sugar, Mm -hmm. fruit, and other sweeteners. I can see that. So there's a conversation where we shouldn't be having sugar... And many people think of fruit when they think of sugar. Refined sugar and fresh fruit are not the same. They're different. They're different. And the studies are remarkable because the sugar that we get in fruit, and that consists of fructose and sucrose, the sugars we get in fruit, when they come into the body with fiber, it's a whole different process. The body's happy. It knows what to do with everything, and everything goes in and comes out fine. But when we have refined sugar without that fiber that wreaks a lot of havoc but as with the oil once in a while 
We've had Andrea on the show today. Once in a while, a well, sweet treat is okay. It's okay, but it needs to be a treat. Right. It shouldn't be a staple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be one of the things. It should be an experience. Right, and Andrea's <laughs> chocolate is definitely an, an experience. experience. Yeah, it's delicious. And then people are confused about dried fruit, maple syrup, and yesterday one of the people that was on was Susan Pierce Thompson. We've had her on the show before, and her focus is on addiction, and there are people who can be addicted to sugar. Sure. And some people are more susceptible. So she has a formula, which is very rigid, very strict, but it has helped so many people. She does not allow on her diet eating dry fruit. It's ah. just concentrated sugar. She will allow fresh fruit in measured portions, but this is for a specific group of people who are really struggling and realize that they have an addiction. Many of us do not have that kind of addiction, and we can enjoy fresh fruit and dried fruit. Now, again, dried fruit is not something that we want to overindulge because without the water in the fruit, we can eat a lot more of it, and then we get a lot more of that gooey, sugary wonderfulness. But the body is designed to eat food packaged in fiber, and that's the way we get the right amount of everything. Wonderful. How do folks tune in to the Food Revolution Summit? At ResponsibleEatingAndLiving.com, we have a banner right on our page. People can Terrific. just click on that and, and get right there. That's fantastic. You do have to register. You have to give your email. But that's okay. But that's okay. Those are good folks at the Food Revolution Summit. What about all of these companies now that are hearing programs like ours and hearing programs like the Food Revolution Summit? And let's say these companies are thinking financially. They're seeing that the trends are now leaning towards plant-based products and so they're jumping on the bandwagon and they're manufacturing in addition to their regular fare which is maybe meat centric they're now starting to go into the world of hey we probably should offer a vegan chicken nugget here at tyson or <laughs> and you know one of the biggest meat producers in the world and so how do you feel about that how do you feel about supporting a company that is really mostly all about meat, but now sees that there's money to be made with selling uh, vegan products? This so is an ongoing discussion that we have all the time, and I have my opinions. Doesn't mean the world's going to listen to me, and I know that the world is going to go and do what it does because it does. <laughs> well, I <laughs> but I don't agree with a lot of the things that are going on. Right. And I'm an idealist. I see the world. I see what the best options are. And I think, why don't we all do the, what's best? But we don't. So, of course, priority number one is stop killing animals. Reduce the consumption of animals. Start to convince people they don't need to consume animals. And maybe these highly processed vegan foods that replace animal products help. I don't know. Some people say they do. I don't know if they do, but if they do, okay, I can get behind it. I just think it's a capitalistic world and companies see a market and they want to fill it. And there are more people that are interested in plant-based foods, plant foods, so they want to fill that market. Because there's money to be made. But a lot of these foods are not healthy or are not the healthiest foods. No. For example, I was just checking out the sites all of the veg sites, talking about an unhealthy food when we were growing up. One of the most unhealthy foods was probably Spam. Oh, God, there's and, vegan Spam. And now, now there's vegan <laughs> Spam. Do you believe that there's vegan Spam? And this was something that I was completely shocked about. Yeah, so there's this company now making this vegan Spam, and it launched in the U.S., and apparently it's doing some business. Now, wasn't Spam a product... That was made, I don't know the history behind Spam, but wasn't it like junk food that they put together to feed well, people? Well, Spam in its original form is a canned cooked pork product that was introduced by the Hormel, the American brand people in 1937. It was initially created in order to increase the sale of pork shoulder, Ugh. which at the time was an unpopular cut of meat. 
So it gained popularity to answer your question. Right. In so World they created, War II, they created a product and because made it had a longer like shelf life. It right. Could last forever. And in World War II, traditional ham was really expensive. Spam was introduced in a lot of places, basically because it could sit on the shelf forever, and you couldn't get fresh food, so you could eat spam during so, the war. So when people exploit animals for food, they want to use as much as the animal as they can. Because right. they'll make money from it. So some people who like to eat meat prefer certain cuts. I hate using all of this terminology, but there are some parts of the animal that people don't want to consume. So people get clever and they say, okay, I'm going to take this piece that I can't sell and figure out something else to do with it. How to make it salty, sugary, and oily. Grind it up, add a bunch of stuff. SOS. And get again. some slick marketing behind it and convince people they want it. And now they're doing it with vegan products. So that's why I asked the question, how do you feel about all of this? It's because if you're focusing on health as the main reason you are transitioning over to a vegan diet, this is going to be just another as Susan Pierce Thompson would probably have a field day with addiction because you've got sugar, you have salt, you have oil in this vegan spam product and it's not going to aid. It's very you. frustrating to me. It's heartbreaking to me. Right. I spend a lot of time coaching people, talking to people who just diagnosed with cancer. What do you tell them about products like this? Well, the first thing I tell them is not to blame themselves because it's not their fault. There's been so much manipulation, so much marketing, and the government is behind it making so many of these horrible foods cheaper than healthy foods. Right. What are people supposed to do? It's very frustrating. And it's frustrating that there are new companies now popping up, seeing an opportunity to make more money. All right. And the food is not healthy. And the food is not healthy. So what you're focusing on in here at Responsible Eating and Living, and obviously at the Food Revolution Summit, is health. And My goal has always been to make healthy food delicious. Right. So that people can choose the best option for their own health, for their family's health, for the environment's health, and for animals, and do it in the most delicious way. And I believe we do that. We do that here at Responsible Eating and Living. Absolutely. That's what we're all about. Well, I'll speak for myself. I started this vegan lifestyle wanting the food to taste exactly like it did when I used to enjoy eating all of the wrong things. And now that I was eating the right things for the lifestyle, I was using a lot of oil, a lot of sugar, a lot of salt. And then little by little after I transitioned off of that phase of the vegan lifestyle, I now try and use no sugar, no oil, and no salt. But on occasion, as with the show today, there are treats. And use a little oil, use a little salt, but find your salt in different forms. Like for example, when I salt something, I usually use miso. That's what I salt it with. And miso has a lot of other properties that are also good for you. Absolutely. You're getting all those good probiotics if the you don't probiotics. cook it up too hot. Yep. Yeah. And so you have to learn that if you cook it too hot, you kill those little bugs that are good for you. So you don't do that. You add your miso at the last minute, etc. But all of that said, what we're really about here and the reason we're trying to do this is because of the animals. We don't want to kill animals. And to try and start there with people, have you also found that that's an automatic door closing when you try and start with the animals with a lot of folks? When you try and say, the reason you go vegan is because of the animals. Because a lot of organizations are now taking the health approach because they're trying to scare people into going vegan because it's a reality. It's not a lie. I mean... This food, these animal foods that people are eating are destroying their health. They're leading to things like cancer. They're leading to things like diabetes. They're leading to all of these autoimmune diseases. So we're focusing now a lot in organizations like the Food Revolution, for example, focusing a lot on health as a way to save the animals. 
Do you find that that's a reality or? Yeah, absolutely. I also think it's an older crowd, a more middle-aged to senior crowd Mm -hmm. that is interested in health. And that's their primary focus. As we age, we see more wear and tear on the body. And that's when the chronic diseases kick in after decades and decades of poor treatment. So these people are getting scared because nobody wants to die. They're curious about healthy food and they see some of their peers or some of their friends or some famous people they see are doing it. So they're interested. And a lot of people are like that, that attend summits like this. And then younger people who feel like they're going to live forever... Right. And they're invulnerable. I've been there. I remember. They're more interested in the environment because they want to know they have a planet that they're going to be able to live on. They're more interested in the vegan diet for environmental reasons. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of these processed foods come in because they're not thinking about health and they're thinking about convenience. They're thinking about being hip and cool and eating all the tasty foods. So sugar. But it's, they're not eating animals, but they may be eating just too many processed foods setting themselves up for a future failure. And folks that are all about saving the animals don't care. That's true too. And they really celebrate all the the vegan ice creams and the vegan cookies and the vegan treats and all the good Yeah, whatever it takes. Just yeah. stop killing animals. Exactly. I'm probably more leaning that way. I don't really care what you eat. Just stop killing animals. <laughs> Yay, hey, you want to eat unhealthy food? Kill yourself early. Fine. Yeah, go for it. Just, but just don't leave animals. the animals alone. <laughs> Let them alone. One of the things that opened my eyes, and you're responsible for this, and then we're also talking about John Robbins, and you said read his book, and I did, and that's like, wow. But one of the things was these animals in captivity create lots of diseases too. And we were just reading about the fur industry and how it relates to COVID-19. Animals in captivity are, some say, the reason we're, we're in this pandemic now. Well, for people who've been following it, there have been stories about mink farms right. for the last year since COVID started. Sure. And it's, I don't want to say that it's amusing, but it's very curious how Mother Nature works. These minks seem to be susceptible to COVID. So humans have given the minks covid And they get sick and some of them die, whatever. And as a result, a lot of minks were killed and then they were buried. And as their bodies were decomposing, it was getting into the water supply. I Ah. believe this happened in Denmark. And, And then they thought it might have been affecting the people because the germs from these animals was out in the environment. Wow. It's fascinating. And so the fur industry is really an example of of how things have changed. If you wear a fur nowadays, a real fur, you're going to get shamed. There are more people that look down on it. As Gary Francione would tell you, what's the difference between wearing a fur coat and wearing leather or eating a beef burger? Exactly. There isn't any difference. There is no difference. Now, some might say, well... The burger, at least, is giving me some nourishment, and I don't need to wear a luxury coat to stay warm. But it's all the same. It is all the same. And when I don't, I don't really like those single issues that are anti foie gras or anti fur coats. It's all the same. Right. So anything we can do to get people to leave the animals alone, eat that junk food, kids, go for it. <laughs> But back to the minks, just like all animals that are farmed for human exploitation, either for food or for their skin or for their fur, most of them live in horrific, filthy conditions. And they are ripe for catching disease. And spreading disease to humans. And when it goes from human to animal and then animal to human, there are mutations that occur. And those mutations can become more dangerous. Absolutely. We're hearing a lot about variants now. Yeah. Well, that's another reason to go vegan is to stop the containment of animals because animals need to be free, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, animals in confined quarters spread disease. You know, we've learned this with COVID that when humans are in close quarters, we spread disease. That's why we've had social distancing and six feet apart. So when we cram animals together with no space between them, 
guess what they do? They spread. They share disease. Right. And it's ridiculous. When will we ever learn? When will we ever and learn? When will we ever learn? We're getting really folk songy on this program today. <laughs> We should break out the guitars and start singing. Michael rode the boat ashore. Alleluia. If I had a hammer, Everybody. I'd hammer in the morning. <laughs> I'd ha yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling those times again. On that note, no pun intended. <laughs> we're talking a lot of talk, but we also walk the walk. And we have a documentary called The Lone Vegan that we made after you visited a feedlot. You know, we're talking a lot about confusion. The confusion that happens sometimes on the Food Revolution Summit, where someone says oil bad, and then someone come on, comes on and says oil good. So it's confusing, right? Yeah. But we've been involved in these types of conversations for a long time. For example, you were asked to go to... An honest-to-goodness feedlot where animals are fattened up and then sent off to slaughterhouses to be made into all kinds of products that people eat. But you were invited to a summit of sorts. We were talking about animal agriculture's impact on climate change, which I thought was a very courageous topic for that feedlot owner to want to have. We went and we filmed some things and you spoke in front of a bunch of cattle producers. About this... 350 of them. Right. And they said you have more balls than their bulls. One of the reasons why the feedlot owner wanted you there was because they wanted your point of view. And they also had other people on the panel. The point is, when we were there, we actually saw the way that all of the animals are scientifically fattened up and they all look absolutely the same. There is no variation. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said, what would happen to all the animals? Well, where are all the animals going to go? Which is so dumbfounding because... The people that actually do the artificial inseminating of these animals to make more of them are the ones who are asking that question. Right. And everybody does this. Forcing animals to procreate is basically part of the job of animal agriculture. Raping animals. Impregnating animals. Yes. And so when people ask, well, what's thing. going to happen to all of the cows and chickens and... Well, people will stop raping them and they'll be able to go and live their lives. The ones that are alive can live their lives out and then there won't be any more. And folks seem to forget about the fact that the only reason there are these millions and millions of animals that we're able to grow and slaughter is because somebody is shooting sperm into... An, A cow's womb. Yeah, the cow's womb. And so... Is any of that ever discussed on summits like the Food Revolution? <laughs> I haven't heard that. Well, right here is where you're going to hear it, folks. This is where we talk about it. This is where we talk about the truth. But this is a human thing. We are all in denial. Yeah. We're in denial. And that's where I'm going with this. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm going with why are we in denial? I don't know. So when people hear that they should eat a plant-based diet, one of the first things they think is, but what would I eat? Exactly. They don't even know what's in their food or what foods they can eat that doesn't have animal in it. Spaghetti and marinara doesn't have animal in it. No. Unless, unless your spaghetti a, has eggs in it. So that's one of the things you would want to look at when you read the label. Is this pasta an egg pasta or is it just semolina and water? Make sure you know the difference. Yeah. And, you know, we have this discussion all the time, but... You got to keep having the discussion. You, you got to keep, keep having, having yeah. the conversation. Hey, folks, if the entire world went vegan, the animals would be fine because we'd leave them alone and they would procreate on their own time. Well, if animals weren't grown for food, we would have more space for some sort of wildlife sanctuaries or wildlife land that you'd think hopefully we could leave the animals alone and let them do what they like to do in their own space. And this also includes animals of the sea, everyone. We're talking about fish as well. This qualifies as an animal. It's a sea animal. And we'd stop fishing as well because that's creating a lot of havoc 
with our environment. You know, we haven't seen Seaspiracy yet, which is a new documentary that came out from the makers of Cowspiracy. And Another I reason. like to read blogs by the other side. So there are some fish industry blogs that I like to read. And they are, were indeed nervous with the documentary Seaspiracy because a lot of people were concerned about the environmental devastation caused by overfishing and aquaculture. They're nervous about it. So they were trying to push back by saying the folks that put the, the documentary together were not telling the truth or they were using data that wasn't true and they were digging very deep to find flaws because the truth is the truth. Yeah, you know what we re we should really try to do here at Responsible Eating and Living, speaking of the sea and the truth about the sea and what really goes on is, have we ever talked to Paul Watson on this program? We haven't. You did talk to someone from One Sea One of Shepherd. their chefs. Paul Watson is an activist and environmentalist who founded the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, which is an anti-poaching and direct action group focused on marine conservation activism. And he has a fleet of ships, or at least two or three ships, that sail around and stop people from terrorizing the ecosystem by illegally fishing and doing lots of harm to... The people that are involved with Sea Shepherd are so courageous. Awesome, badass Really people. amazing. They're doing incredible work. Sea Spiracy probably pushes a lot of buttons. When we're talking about farm animals, we're also talking about fish. And going vegan means you give up the fish as well. You know, we don't talk about insects on this program. But I want to say that insects are included too because there are investors getting all excited about marketing bug products as protein sources. And we don't want to exploit insects either. That's that P word again, protein. So many people don't think you can get protein from plants. They just refuse to believe it. They are in <laughs> denial about it. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you. I hope everybody has enjoyed our conversation. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Send us an email at info at realmeals.org. Leave the animals alone. Go out there and eat whatever you want as long as it's vegan. <laughs> but if you care about your health. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's go whole food, plant-based, organic. Let's do that. Let's do that. But just leave the animals alone. Let's leave the animals alone. Take your hands off of that animal. <laughs> thanks for joining me, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Everybody. Thanks for joining everybody. me, everybody. everybody. Have, Have a delicious, delicious week. week.